Okay, so programming productivity, what really matters? I'm JJ. My mom named me with a girl's name, Shannon. Hi, mom. Um, I go by JJ. Some people were confused by that. Um, I was late, and that's because I get lost, not because I'm not productive. I get lost in bathrooms, actually. So that's a separate issue. Um, I never claim to be productive either, but that's a, another matter. Um, so uh, I started life at e-commerce shops, um, in e-commerce shops, and uh, well, when I was working in e-commerce, we had a simple philosophy, uh, deliver yesterday, code today, think tomorrow. Um, you know, it, it doesn't really matter anyway because you're gonna throw it away in two years. So like, it, that's just fine. But starting there gave me a perspective where I only care about getting as much functionality done in as little time as possible. I couldn't care less about writing assembly language code. I mean, I learned assembler in college, that's great, but like, I want to get shit done. I want to get stuff done as quickly as possible, and that's really my emphasis. Um, so, as an e-commerce guy, you always have uh, too few people, too little time. Um, websites get thrown away every two years. Um, so the interesting thing about uh, websites getting away, thrown away every two years, um, you know, you put a lot of time and effort into programming. I'm a perfectionist. But the funny thing is there's no connection between good code and code that lasts a long time. Um, so another reason I care an awful lot about productivity is that uh, I have three kids and I have a fourth one on the way. So I'm a little bit busy. I work at a startup now on top of that. But despite all of, despite all of that and all this talk, I must uh, be upfront and say I'm not a productivity expert. It's something that fascinates me and I expect you guys will just like realize how much of an idiot I am by the time we get done with this. But I, I hope in the meantime to at least entertain you. So, um, so let me uh, define progr programmer productivity. Typing really, really fast. Um, so I define programmer uh, productivity in terms of uh, features per man month. Um, now, as part of that definition, you must not sacrifice quality, uh, you must maintain long-term maintainability, and you must maintain the ability to work with others. Uh, and whenever possible, in fact, we need to improve programmer parallelization. Typing pool. I couldn't come up with a better image for a typing pool. That's okay. Um, so uh, specifically tonight, I'm not going to cover agile programming or time management. Uh, both are more important than this article, so like if you don't know those, you should just like leave now and go like uh, buy a book on those. But you know, um, I, I can't cover everything. Um, let me see. In fact, so hang on. I should have printed this stuff bigger. Um, um, by the way, um, talking about uh, productivity, I guess you guys can't see that, but um, and time management, I actually use a straight text to do file, which I edit using Vim because I'm a Vim guy. And I actually use this like a kernel process list, which means that I edit it every time I context switch which is, you know, like a lot. But that's great because I'm likely to forget things in about five minutes anyway, and so that's what a kernel process list is for. Okay. I could try, but it failed. Oh, let's try that. Let's see slideshow settings. All right. Let's try it. Yeah. A little bit. Um, oh, mm, maybe I wasn't ready for that one. Um, oh, if you guys want to see that, there. Uh, fix bugs for fox marks in my personal life. Write an article about productivity. 
I think I'm going to skip that one after this talk. Oh, yeah. So. Uh, ooh. The little X's. That one. This one. Oh, yeah. Doesn't really help. I'm sorry about that. Ooh, that's not going to help. Okay. View. Uh, I must admit that this is actually my first time doing a slideshow. Like, I... I um, yeah. Oh, yeah. Now we got to get back that window that we lost. View norm slides sorter. No. Page up and page down. Uh, close this window. Oh. You said view norm. Oh. Okay. Well, that's. Okay. Thank you. Okay. What I'm also not going to talk about is how to do slideshows. Um, <laughs> You know, I'm a programmer, not a PM or something like that. That's my lame excuse. Um, I'm specifically talking about programmer productivity. OK. Um, uh, one more thing I want to say about um, time management. The one thing that I finally drilled through my head is time management is about figuring out what's important and then dropping everything else you possibly can because you're never going to get to it anyway. Uh, unless it's fun. Well, I mean, yeah. Uh, so I have my fourth kid coming on the way. Um, so, yeah, I don't drop all the things that are fun. Uh, but like I said, there's too many other sources of information on time management, so I'm not going to cover those. So uh, one thing that I did want to mention is that there's a lot of uh, false improvements in productivity. Uh, I like to call these red herrings. Um, so a red herring is, just in, for those like non-native English speakers, a red herring is something that draws attention away from the central issue. Um, so for instance, let's talk about performance versus productivity. Uh, writing something in C that works really, really fast, that's cool, but that's not productivity, that's performance. And in fact, uh, I could also mention, um, since you're looking at me where I care about performance, Performance, you know, I got to write websites and they got to show up like, you know, like a thousand hits a minute and stuff like that. Well, um, that's performance versus scalability. And so let me talk about scalability. <laughs> uh, so, in fact, in my mind, if, huh? Those are big. And it lasts a long time. Um, scale up is, in my mind, as long as, um, I, c I could horizontally scale and throw more servers at the problem and scale linearly. I don't care because the fact of the matter is I cost a lot more than servers do. I, hmm? Save planet Earth. Um, I don't spend that much on servers. Uh, so uh, the simple fact of the matter is like unlike like 20 or 30 years ago, um, Programmer time these days is the most precious commodity. So for an embedded programmer, you could futz around, like tune out that last, you know, couple cycles, and like if you have to throw in one more little tiny piece of hardware, you're dead in the water, or use a chip that could do slightly more. That's just not the case for the majority of us. I think the majority of us, it's really programmer time is just the most expensive and precious thing. So uh, I want to talk about limits of productivity. Um, what can productivity uh, not solve? Like, how far can you go? <laughs> you cannot rewrite Linux in 24 hours. And in fact, if you take every package that's in Debian with the metaverse and universe and everything, I don't think like we could rewrite it as an 
industry within 10 years, maybe 20, I don't know. But there's, there's just limits to how much you could do, and especially with software these days, it's freaking huge. So there's just, there's limits. Um, but nonetheless, I work at a startup, and uh, I need to get more done. Uh, we have nice code, we have docs, comments, tests, we're pretty agile, um, but I need more. Um, and add compounding this problem is the fact that these days it's like incredibly difficult to hire people. You know, I, we recognize we have positions open. If you want to be like, if you want to work at Fox Marks, that's great. Come talk to me afterwards. Uh, there's a real shortage of talented people um, in the industry. And, you know, I've really thought long and hard about where all the good people went. Okay, so uh, my first thing, I'm going to talk about three things, um, work environment, development environment, and programming languages. I guess I should cover like an outline, but anyway, there's outline. Uh, so the first thing is uh, work environment. So uh, lifehack.org, if I was more productive and had more time and fewer children, I would love to subscribe to this, but apparently this is a great place to become a more productive person. That's all I could say because I haven't gotten there, but I thought I should mention it. Um, so uh, just randomly spouting out random facts that I've learned because I've been reading a lot about this topic lately. Uh, having your own office results in um, increased productivity. Um, uh, uh, since I don't have my own office, I have to work at a startup. In fact, it's San Francisco, so we don't even have cubes. Um, I resort to late night hack sessions, and I've done that my entire career. I've been doing it 10 years. I could do it once a week if I need to, not indefinitely, but um, late night hack sessions are God's gift to coding in my mind. Um, we've got to get away from that. My wife doesn't like it so much. Um, but the conclusion to make is that interruptions kill code. Um, is long, is every time you get interrupted when you're coding, that severely impacts uh, prog programmer productivity because, I mean, what we do is hard. It takes a lot of thinking you got to get deep, and that's just the way it goes. Um, and in fact, recent studies have shown that constantly multitasking can reduce your IQ by like 10 points, which, I mean, you know, I don't have enough as it is, so I just can't give up 10. Um, so um, other random topics of interest, uh, music or no music when you're coding. Um, I read recently that uh, tax com task complexity and distraction should be inversely proportional. So um, I have uh, interesting equations to convey this. Uh, Python for dummies plus iPod equals success. Um, uh, design patterns plus iPod equals much frustration. Yeah. So, so if you're writing a hard piece of code, uh, turn off the iPod. Uh, so, uh, like in my quest for greater productivity, I thought, hey, if I could type twice as fast, maybe that would make me more productive. And so, what do you do when you want to type twice as fast? You go learn how to use a Dvorak keyboard. Um, and then before I actually did that, I realized quickly that like we're an agile shop and we got to do peer programming all the time, so that's kind of not cool. And I thought, hey, maybe I could get a second keyboard and plug it into USB. I'm not sure if that works. But then I thought, oh, it does. That's great. Um, oh, but what about all those times I have to like go to like my dad's house and like admin his Linux box, and he doesn't have a, a Dvorak keyboard and. Although, if you notice this shirt, it's a binary shirt, which I'm pretty proud of that, so. Um, is that Linux using grandpa? Um, uh, but to summarize about the Dvorak, typing's really not the problem. Um, it, like, typing's a small part of coding. If it really came down to typing, like, I really could rewrite Linux in like a year. I probably could type most of the Linux source code in a year, because I do type pretty fast, but it's not really about typing. Um, so on to development environment. Uh, be a whiz with your shell and your editor. Be a master. Continually polish your skills. Know your shell. 
I'm pretty sure I have one of the red ones. Um, so being a show newbie is a clear waste of time. You're sitting there, you're looking at your shows, you're not spending a lot of time th thinking. Like, when I'm in front of a show, my fingers are going. And so being able to go faster is a clear win. Um, so similarly, being able to script common tasks, that is a clear productivity improvement. I mean, not being able to say you want to rename all the files in a certain directory, that's trivial with the for loop. It's trivial to write the for loop. If you do it by hand, you're wasting your time. Um, similarly, like one touch installs. I mean, I can't say enough about that. I mean, everyone knows you need one touch installs, things like that. Um, Todd, I'll get to um, one touch installs later this week. Um, uh, similarly, editor macros can be a clear win. I don't, um, I don't end up using those all the time, but sometimes you're working on a piece of code, you need to do something repetitive, and um, a macro will take something down from six hours to like half an hour. Um, uh, if you guys use Bash or Z Shell, um, just as a random comment, do you guys know about Control R, uh, which is um, history incremental search backward? So you're typing a bunch of commands, and you're like, Control R, and you type part of the command, and you go up to the, the one. I love that one. I, that, that huge productivity improvement. Um, so because I'm constantly honing my skills, I um, recently switched to Z Shell, and um, I like it, and it's made me pr more productive already. Um, the funny thing about it, though, is if you read the docs, it seems like they're, I'm not sure whether they're more like obsessed with programmer productivity or just general tinkering. Um, that's Grease Lightning. You guys remember Grease? Okay. okay, so making your editor fly. Yeah. <laughs> um, one interesting thing is one of the best programmers I know, Kelly Yancey, um, he uses Pico, and I just can't understand that. Like, and the funny thing is that my previous company, I worked for a guy named... Um, um, Oh, brain deadness. Uh, Mark, he was a FreeBSD committer, brilliant guy. He used VI and refused to switch to Vim, which Vim has clear productivity enhancements with like no additional cost. I mean, it's still wickedly fast. And so there's one thing I've really noticed. I've talked to a lot of people because I like to tinker, and like there's no connection between um, like skill of a programmer and skill with an editor. In fact, Oftentimes, I find that really talented programmers aren't that great with an editor, and it's just, it shocks me, but you know, uh, that's the way it is. Um, so I had a buddy who was an Emacs user, very, very productive, not one of the editor newbies, and um, next point, by the way. Um, one thing that he and I discussed and, and came, became clear in my mind is, user-friendly is not what you want to prioritize for in your editor. We're programmers, we spend eight hours a day in an editor. We know how to use the things, I know how to use mine. I, 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 you know, I know Vim inside and out, and so it's like user-friendly, if it comes out of the cost and productivity, uh, not so cool. Um, so, uh, Perhaps one of the reasons why uh, being a whiz at your editor isn't the end-all be-all in making a good programmer is that, uh, in fact, you spend more time reading code than you do writing code. And so, I mean, code is read like three, four times to every time it's written, maybe more. You know, I, I don't have a like eye count or anything like that, but it's obviously read many more times than it's written. And so, I don't know how fast he typed that, but I can't read it no matter how much time I spend on it. Anybody know where that's from? Well done. Uh, International Office of Skated C Coding Contest. <laughs> huh? Yeah, I mean, it, the, it has to do something. Um, so hence being able to enter code really isn't the limiting factor. Uh, you spend more time thinking than you do actually typing. I spend a lot of time thinking, or at least that's what I tell my boss. Um, it's like I had to put it in there somewhere. Uh, so 
um, the flip side of like having these awesome editors is like you have these Eclipse guys and stuff like that that like have these wicked fast editors. Have you guys ever seen a screencast where like the PHP or Ruby on Rails guys is like going and like the editors typing half the code and it's like you know the Eclipse can generate all your public properties for you. Um, I personally feel that generating boilerplate quickly is actually more of an insult than a benefit. Um, so, for instance, uh, I asked my buddy, because I'm not a Java expert, I mean, I know Java, but I'm no expert. I said, can you give me a class that has three properties in it? It didn't fit on the slide. So his, his IDE generated that for him, and that's great. Except for it's not, because you can't, I mean, there's three properties there, and you can't read that. Well, probably because it's too small and you guys are in the audience, but I can't read it. Um, so similarly, just uh, the other day on the uh, uh, Yahoo user interfaces blog, there were these guys who tricked out um, uh, their um, text mate to you know, do that whiz bang thing where you quickly enter, enter code, and here you can see they type like, a few characters and then a menu pops up and you select stuff and it automatically puts in stuff for you. But look at the code. It's like yahoo.util.dom, yahoo.util. Like, thank God Guido gave us import. You know? Like, we don't have to type that stuff. It's a waste of time to look at it, let alone type it. Uh, but despite the above, do uh, learn how to type and uh, do become an editor wizard. So the funny thing about people who don't know how to type, I'm sorry if I'm like insulting you. Um, uh, some people could type without like touch typing and do it really fast. But like I've seen oftentimes that people who don't know how to type and can't control their editor quickly, their mind works faster than their fingers do. And in my case, my fingers work much faster than my mind. But the, the drawback of your mind working faster than your fingers is that you don't follow the style guide a lot. And I've seen programmers who are just like wicked smart, awesome memory, and what they do is they go on Google, they grab a piece uh, of code from some random project, they paste it in, they don't reformat it, and they don't comment it. It doesn't matter because they have amazing memories, they know where it was from, they know what it does, and um, they're never going to forget, so they don't need comments, and their brains work so much faster, much faster than mine. So they they could part visually parse it, and they don't need to reformat it. But like, um, sorry, I can't do that. And when I'm reading other people's code, um, I need it like indented properly. It makes me faster. And remember, I read more than other people write, so I'm what matters. So recently, um, thanks to our editor wars, um, I, I got interested in Wing IDE, and I thought, hey, like, you know, is this going to make me more productive um, switching to Wing IDE instead of Vim? And so it's really a trade-off in um, raw editor performance in terms of like I know Vim inside and out versus Wing IDE, which could show me documentation as I'm going instead of like what I usually do, which is refer to the Python shell, and. Um, I'm kind of up in the air about it. Like, I, I gave it a try, and, and don't tell me that the Vim key bindings in Wing IE exist, because they're just not the same. Um, it's probably true for Emacs, but it's just not the same. And so I'm kind of at a loss, and like, I, I, maybe I'm getting old and closed minded, but I'm sticking to Vim. Um, but, like, what if you want the best of both worlds? Uh, well, maybe not. Uh, so no one size fits all, and if I did need to be in a certain mode, I probably would use both. Like, I think it's a good thing to be open-minded and switch back and forth, whatever. Anyway, uh, programming languages. Um, ooh, let's not go there. So uh, let's talk about some red herrings as far as programming languages. Uh, optimizing for code size. Uh, you guys can't see that, nor can you. That's some APL. I think the top one like finds prime numbers. Um, you know, there's that saying: it's the dream of every coder to like write uh, uh, APL program and actually have it compile. I wrote one that had just a comment one time and it compiled. But like, um, uh, w when we had APL, when we the APL experience, perhaps like the Perl experience, taught us that uh, shorter code isn't always better. Uh, like I said, you're gonna.
Alex, I stand corrected. Thank you. I'm young. I mean that in both ways, like pretty young. Um, I do stand corrected. Uh, so um, I was recently in a, cr um, like in a functional language craze. I mean, a lot of us get into that sometimes. And so, you know, I went through OCaml, I went through um, Haskell. I wrote two articles on Haskell, as you guys probably saw. My recent love affair was with Erlang. I was in love with Alice for a couple of days. Alice, the language, not the music, not the radio station. Um, and the one thing I've noticed, I put a lot of effort into Haskell, but there's one thing that's interesting, and that's that when you call a function and you read a code that calls a function, for us programmers, you don't have to know what the function does. I mean, you look at the name and you kind of know how it, what it does, and like that's enough. I mean, our minds work with that. But when you deal with new programming constructs, such as monads, you could look at it, and unless you know exactly how that monad is implemented, you can't read that code. So, for instance, just like, um, uh, just as an illustration, I love map, I love lambda, reduce, all of that stuff, but unless you know what map does, um, that's not a new programming construct, that's just a function, but unless you know what it does, that top one's not readable. But the bottom one, like, for someone who doesn't know Python, the, you could probably squeeze by. And it's worse when you have difficult programming constructs. And so as much as I love functional languages, as much as, you know, I want to be productive, I realize the fact that, like, look, I could code Haskell code and I, I could read other people's Haskell code, but unless I know every single one of the libraries with all the, the monads and understand all of those interesting higher-level constructs, I can't understand the code. And so I'm not saying it's bad, but, like, it doesn't impact productivity. So uh, similarly, uh, the same thing can be said about heavily macroized um, Lisp code. So common Lisp macros rule. So I've been told, I'm sorry, I haven't done them. Um, I'm willing to believe that they rule. I'm willing to believe that DSLs are cool. I like DSLs, actually. You know, I, I do simple ones, like, you know, within the limits of my um, environment. Those are cool. But in particular, when you have control over DSLs, such as in common Lisps, you could look at code, and it might be short, but, and that's cool, and I don't want to knock that, but, like, I do want to remind you that, like, you really don't know what's going on versus you don't really understand the flow so much as, as with the function call, you know you call a function that comes back, but with the DSL in certain situations, God help us, you don't know. And so I, I want to say that DSLs are wonderful, but they are a two-edged sword. You, they could cut you, they could make things better, um, I mean, you just have to understand that, you know, hammers can kill people. Um, so the next fallacy, I'm sure that there's going to be programming, uh, functional programming geeks out there who are going to hate me. Okay. No, they already turned off. Okay. So optimizing for uh, don't repeat yourself versus code size. Um, so I've invented this new programming language called python.zip. It automatically reduces code duplication. It's the most succinct co uh, source code ever. All code conveniently fits inside a single file. You have to use this great new editor called hex edit to edit it, but like, it's fantastic programming language. Um, so, um, yeah. Uh, mm, optimizing for DRY and code size. Oh, okay, so there's some limits. But um, nonetheless, do embrace uh, DRY, uh, don't repeat yourself. Um, copy and paste non-productivity. So one time I, was, I had the uh, benefit of working with, the, with some outsourced resources and um, my boss gave me some code. He says, hey, can you code review this? We just got this stuff in. And I was like, oh wow, it's like 800 lines in one module. He wrote this really fast. And so I'm looking through the code and there's this comment that says, oh, um, Underneath every function, there would be this uh, this comment that says, this function was imported from some file. Um, import is not the same as copy and paste. 
refactor it. You know, if you can't import it directly for whatever reason, refactor it and don't copy and paste. It's evil. Um, so, if we're going to think about more productive programming languages, um, what's an approach? Well, we could uh, take our code and look at it and take a red pen and start crossing things out that don't actually matter. So uh, I've taken this Java code and, okay, watch closely. <laughs> I got rid of the curly braces and the semicolons. <laughs> I feel more productive already. Uh, so, okay, more seriously, uh, let's take a historical perspective on what we've been able to get rid of from our code. So we no longer think about register allocation. That's fantastic. GCC does a better job than I could ever do. I guarantee it, because Stallman's smarter than me. Although I'm better looking. <laughs> uh, as far as memory management, um, uh, we don't think about code overlays. Uh, we don't think about uh, uh, OS memory I mean, we do think about OS memory paging. That was an improvement. Um, back in the old days with Cobalt, they didn't have dynamic memory. I just can't imagine. Like, every time I hear that, I think, oh, I'm going to generate a huge array and, like, implement Lisp in Cobalt or something like that. It's just, I just can't imagine that. Uh, but these days, we've moved from C to, like, languages where we have full memory management. And in my mind, that's a, of course, I mean, that's just a wonderful thing. I mean, if, if you're not writing a device driver, it's great, and hopefully one of these days we will be writing a device driver with memory management, but I'm speaking outside my field of expertise, so I could be an idiot. Um, similarly, error handling in C. Mm. Uh, so I read the Linux programming book, and uh, I learned how to read along from standard in, and uh, I packaged it in a function. God, that sucks. Like, look at the error hand handling that you need to do to do it right. That's just bad. And I'm glad that like with Python exceptions and like these days things are just better. And so we've come a long way is what I'm saying. So, um, but still the rest of the world isn't completely caught up with this hip, slick and cool Python people. Does anybody know what that does? I mean, it, it just creates a list. You know, I, I know Java pretty well, but like ArrayList, I mean, I learned that by reading Bruce Eccles uh, weblog that like ArrayList is the one that you want to use by default without thinking, like if you don't care, because like 99% of the time, I really don't care. I just want it something reasonable. And if I need to tune it and pick a different implementation of list, I'll come back. And um, the second line, that's to get the last element in the list. And that's just, the, Travesty. I mean, at the very least, they could have had a method call. But, like, hey, you know, Guido gave us, you know, brackets with a negative one, so, like. Oh, you're right. Thank you. That is wrong. There should be a space. I had a Java programmer review this. You yeah. know? And I, no, but I'm, just, I'm seriously saying, I, I had a Java programmer review this, and because there's so much verbosity, he didn't notice that, is what I'm saying. Um, and that's a problem. Um, hmm? uh, so what's really next? Uh, the fact of the matter is uh, Java and uh, C Sharp, uh, Python, Ruby, PHP, and Perl, they're kind of in the same categories. I know that like half of you will want to kill me for putting Ruby and PHP, or PHP especially, in the same category. But like, they really are in the same class. And we're not looking like a level beyond. And so you know, I'm sure that the functional programmers out there um, will say, hey, Haskell's the way beyond. Uh, I've spent a lot of time. Maybe it is. Um, uh, you know, maybe like the next thing is getting rid of uh, type declarations and letting the compiler be smart enough to like um, automatically recognize them. Um, but the funny thing about like coding in Haskell and like I could say this to a Python crowd is that like I spend twice as much time thinking about types by not try by trying to not think about types. 
as like in Python, where like I could really not think about types more effectively. And so, um, here's an example. So I wrote an article called um, Oh, I don't even remember the name. I wrote a C type declaration in Parser and, and Haskell. It was cool. Um, so look at that first line: get token colon colon state parse context less than greater than. So. I kid you not, I spent two days learning how the state monad works. I've read it on Wikipedia. I think I've read three separate tutorials. I admit I'm not a genius. Um, there's far smarter people than me, and I understand it now. But my God, how does that, like, those, those words, like, compared to the thing, and that's what I'm talking about, where, like, higher level constructs, they don't, like, unless you know them backwards, inside and out, like, it, there is some cost, and in fact, someone who doesn't know the state monad, like, he's not going to understand that. And yeah, that's all I have to say about trying to get the compiler to be smart enough about types. Um, hopefully, like, um, you know, there's a bunch of Python projects where um, you know the compiler can assist you and be smarter. Like, um, uh, Psycho is cool. That's awesome because it doesn't require me thinking about it. And anytime I don't have to think, I think it's a win. Or, in fact, I don't think it's a win. It's just a win. Okay. Um, so the mythical man month says that there are no silver bullets. You're screwed. Um, I'm looking for copper slugs made in bulk that I could buy at Walmart. Um, so Brooke argues that there will be no more technologies or practices that will silver serve as silver bullets and create a tenfold improvement in programmer productivity over 10 years. I think it's 10 years has passed, but um, the phase is often quoted and applied to productivity, quality, and control. I got that from Wikipedia. Um, hey, you know, Brooks was a smarter guy than me, and I'm not gonna, like, contradict that. Um, one of the key uh, things that he mentions is accidental versus uh, central complexity. At the heart of the argument is the distinction between accidental complexity and essential complexity. Accidental complexity relates, uh, relates problems that we create on our own and can be fixed, for example, the details of writing and optimizing assembly code. Essential complexity is caused by the problem to be solved and nothing can remove uh, it. If users want a program to do 30 different things, then those 30 different things are essential and the program must, um, must do those uh, 30 different things. Um, so we're stuck with um, um, uh, the essential complexity. So, uh, well, you know, you guys have waited a long time. You, you, you ready for my solution? Um, there's only one solution to this mess. Think less. Let someone else do it. Um, and I'm serious. Like, if I'm coding my day job, the less stuff I have to think about to get the given features out the door, the better. If someone out there has already written a program that does exactly what I need, I'm going to use it. And what's better is that they probably had to think about the details that I could remain completely ignorant about. Um, so uh, the interesting thing about being able to think less is that most code these days is about organizing, presenting, and sharing data. You guys know all those CRUD, create, read, update, delete, SQL, the web? Hey, these things are godsends in my mind. I, I still argue that, like, Within the last 30 years, I haven't been coding for 30 years, but like number one, best thing in the world, the internet. Number two, SQL. Many people will think that that's silly, but like if you guys could remember a time before SQL when you had to like manage your data on disk by hand, my goodness, like people these days are like, oh, I don't want to have to write SQL statements. You should be so thankful that you have to write SQL statements. When I was young, we stored the data on the disk. We coded uphill both ways. Yeah. So uh, there's three, there's a couple of techniques uh, for thinking less. Um, so the Ruby guys are probably laughing at me. So of course there's convention versus configuration. So you just do things the right way and you don't have to think about all the weird details of not doing things the other way. Uh, policy of least astonishment, that one's great. So both the FreeBSD guys and the Ruby on Rails guys embrace this one. This is the way, this is their way of saying, look, um, 
um, we're Japanese speakers, and we don't write English comments very well, so it's just it, it's going to work the way we say it, the way you think it would work. Okay, sorry. That was a bad slam. I really like the guy who wrote Rupee. Anyway, um, policy of least astonishment says that um, it should work the way you think it's going to work. And the nice thing about that is, is that that means you don't have to think about the details because they're the way you think that they should be. Um, the next thing is embrace the 80-20 rule. And as a perfectionist, you know, this is something that I um, struggled with for a long time. I mean, there are people who could code circles around me, but my code is higher quality. And you know what? Like, there's a big benefit of getting 80% uh, of the functionality for 20% of the work. And like, anytime you could do it, that's awesome. Oh. Uh, create, uh, read, update, and delete. And so it's like with data, you create it, you read it, you update it, and delete it. It's what you do with SQL. Select, insert, update, and delete. Okay. So. so um, now that I'm finishing, um, uh, tell me more. Like half the reason why I wrote this is because I admitted that I'm not as fast as I need to be. I'm at a startup, I need to get more stuff done, and like I expect you guys to call me an idiot and tell me how to do it better, and when tomorrow I start coding twice as fast, I'll actually be really thankful. So there's my email address, or you could slip me a piece of paper, because I guarantee you, if you just tell me, I'll forget it. So please don't just tell me, give me at least a piece of paper or an email. Okay, Alex. So my favorite suggestion for time management is a uh, O'Reilly book, Tom Limoncelli, time management for system administrators. I uh, was not sure why I actually started looking at it because I'm not a system administrator. At, at least 90% of the book is fully applicable to programmers as well. I really heartily recommend it. I, uh, actually, Tom is now uh, working at Google, but he wasn't when he wrote the book. So, Awesome. Make sure you give me a piece of paper and email, please, Alex. Uh, make sure you give me that on a piece of paper or an email. Thank you. That's awesome. Maybe you can summarize it on the list. Yeah, list, yeah. Dennis. Um, I find I spend a lot of my time correlating, looking things up, trying to uh, um, um, uh, read four different uh, uh, source programs so I can trace things through, and uh, a couple reference books, and uh, uh, an API, and, you know, uh, uh, and you didn't really address that as where the thinking and analysis I time goes. I can give you some um, pointers. Um, I max my resolution as much as possible, and I have virtual desktops. I have four of them, in fact. Um, so one, two, three, four. Um, I know where everything is at all times because I put things in the same place every time, and I, I, I always look at expose and Mac, and you know, God help those people, that was great because they were needed, but I think that if you're looking for something you've already lost the battle. You need to know where it is ahead of time. And so I have multiple tabs open in my Firefox. I could fit many terminal windows and many editor windows on the same screen, and that's how I deal with it. Search. <laughs> yeah, so that was on my list as well. Big monitors. I know that that's, that's almost uh, religion around here. But a couple big 24-inch monitors helps a lot. So um, one of the things that I got a few years ago was the testing religion which I, I know you guys, but so we have a rule. Uh, if you're reading code, which you do a lot more than you're, you're writing code, and you see something, fix it. Because we're a small shop and we have the tests, so just always fix it, even if it's not your code. Or if you can make it cleaner, nicer looking, anything like that, just fix it, do it right then and there. So I, I uh, think I could address that. Um, that's awesome. Um, we have a slightly different rule, and that's that we use our bug tracker like crazy. And I'm really a big fan of small bugs because they make me feel productive when I'm in between large bugs. And so I, I'll create quick bugs real quick so I don't have to lose my train of thought because I don't have enough swap space up there. Yeah, yeah. I think there's a difference between sort of the bug and the, the docs could be a little better here, but, but that's a good one as well. Um, the 80-20 rule, I'm also a big believer in that. We've, we've kind of taken that... I don't know, one step further, a little bit different. We say the programmer is part of the program. So uh, we don't know often, we don't have a product manager at a little, at a little startup, although we're hiring. Um, in any case, so we don't know sometimes, is this going to work, is this not going to work? So if we can prefer to do something manually, like if I have to read something on the screen and then type it in and read and type it in and read and type it in as part of the ongoing running of our application, 
and uh, it turns out that it wasn't a useful feature, I haven't wasted any time coding or haven't wasted a lot of time coding. So the programmer can be part of the program. And if it turns out I am typing a lot, then, well, then, I'll, then I'll code. I'll do some more work to automate it. I think that that meshes nicely with the extreme programming um, uh, edict that defer decisions because decisions require thinking. Yeah. And, and the last one, uh, the last one is, uh, is a meta observation. I think you're very good at this, uh, at least in my limited observation, and that is just be relentlessly curious. You know, discovering TextMate or Z Shell, and if you throw it away, great. You know, you looked, you tried, am I going to be a little bit better? The only trick is you got to make sure you don't do it for eight hours a day, right? But yeah. for an hour a day, just driving or listening or whatever, if you're always curious, always seeking something new or better, you know, a little 10% here, 10% there, pretty soon, well, it's, you know, 11%. I, I can't agree with you more. If you're not curious, if you don't love your work, go home. I was hoping you would mention this. So if you're having three, four shells, two, four editors, a SQL prompt, and a MySQL server or something else running, you need screen. Screen rules. Screen. I've got my own complaints about screen. It's a tool that we all must have and I hate. But anyway. Yes, I agree, though. So uh, one thing, I guess, about you know when you're doing a lot of SQL uh, is to keep things uh, broken down as much as possible and to not, like, not abuse SQL. But you know, keep a very keep a very simple schema if possible. Don't do a lot of joins, and that keeps your code in general a lot cleaner. Especially when you end up having to scale, um, just makes it a lot, a lot cleaner. I think I just think in general, really simple design patterns. Absolutely. Anytime you can embrace simplicity, that's definitely um, a win. Yeah, I agree. Oh no. So we had a talk about simplicity uh, today by a guy from the MIT Media Labs. He's got this, John Mead, he's got this book just, just out about simplicity and he's got the 12 rules. He's a very funny guy. Um, I've de dealt with non-normalized uh, SQL schemas in my time and the point was, oh, but if I do normalize, I will have to do many joints and it will be complicated. And oh, I, yes. Uh, I haven't really committed many murders in my life, but if if I look at what murders have done in my mind, I think the majority was about this. Because people, there's a view statement. Oh, no, I use my SQL. Well, then go get a database instead <laughs> and use view and, and apply the first rule of simplicity, actually, as, as John Mighty say calls it, encapsulate. As Have all the joints you need underneath and make a view that looks like a table and is simple to use. But if I have to see yet one more non-normalized schema, uh, I hope somebody will rule justifiable homicide because I am going to. Uh, good point. Um, as simple as possible and don't, uh, simplicity is not an excuse to do naughty things. Hey, JJ, just a comment. Uh, at my current job, I'm doing something a little bit different than I've ever done in my programming career. So the management is adopting this uh, bit of extreme programming where you're only uh, assigned tasks which take at most three days. And so what happens is they write these tasks down on cards and they put these cards up and you estimate how long, you know, between one and three days with half day increments and you choose, you know, you basically determine how long they take and, you know, as you finish each task, you throw away the card and you're done with that and you move on to the next one and the next one. I find that's a good way to keep focus. I don't know, does that, has anyone ever done that So actually too? we do do that okay. and um, I didn't cover it because the XP book was uh, better than I could get, like, convey up here and so I kind of, like, I didn't talk about agile programming but in fact we do do that. Sure. So that's good. It's, it is very good and helpful. One of the things that I still question about it, because, you know, again, I'm new to this, is that uh, I feel that because you're trying to uh, turn around these things in very short order, that I feel like I'm not spending enough time architecting a solution for cards that haven't been written yet. And I feel like I'm throwing away more code or having to rewrite more code than I used to when I used to do things the old-fashioned way. So that's the only thing that kind of bothers me a little bit about the using so the cards and the short Galileo tasks. Galileo said that it's easier for me to build a three-inch um, telescope lens and then a five-inch telescope lens than it is for me to build a five-inch telescope lens. So sometimes, like, rewriting, about. we type <laughs> fast. 
Refactoring, it's good. You can't get it right the first time because if you, you try to make it complex, you'll get it wrong and then you'll have complexity for no reason. So it's, it's okay. It's, it's okay to like start off simple and then refactor. That's the, that's the secret. That's the magic sauce. Well, see, the other thing that I fight against also is my perfectionism as well, because when I want to do something, I want to do it right, and something that could be uh, expanded on, more very plug-and-play oriented, that for things that you haven't even thought of yet. And so this sort of changes that, where I can't think as deeply or be like a real architect. I'm now, I'm now an efficient programmer, but I'm not as much of a software architect. So I don't know if that makes any sense or not. So, so the thing is, you have to internally change your definition of perfection. And I've actually faced this just as well. If you try to make it the most flexible thing in the world, it's going to end up looking like C++. Um, and that's all I have to say about that. Um, hi. Yeah, uh, you'd mentioned this witticism about uh, working on a, or you're expressing your preference for working on a number of small bugs in between the large bugs, um, I, w which got me to thinking, do you actually do strict test-driven development yourself? Okay, so I'm going to show my dirty underwear just like everybody else in the world where um, uh, in cases where I know what the test is going to look like ahead of time, I do like writing it first. But like I am a web developer, and so there's a substantial amount of stuff where I just want to see something because it's like I can't write a test that says make it look nice, and so I I do fight with that, and so I, I could honestly say I don't test. I'm not always test driven. I'm not saying that that's good or bad. I'm just saying what I do. Well, if Alex can talk twice, then I can too. So uh, to your question or to your concern, so I have to flip the bit sometime. You know, am I, am I writing a library or am I an application developer? And, and sometimes you don't know, right? You're writing an application and that code is going to get reused by others. But sometimes you do have a good sense. And so you can play the 80-20 rule. And again, just be perfect on the 80% or the 20% that implements the 80%. Um, and the last and my last comment, because I find it hard to shut up, is that the comment about keeping your schema simple, I think, is really good. But you do have to watch out for the local complexity versus global complexity issue. So, you know, if I simplify the schema, is that a local minima, or um, and that's going to cause me to have a huge number of backend servers and horrible performance and so forth. So, I think while it's definitely laudable to keep your schema simple. The reason why our app scales, I think, as well as it does is because we have an ex extremely complex SQL implementation. Now, hopefully, the core part of the schema is understandable, but we do a lot in the database and, um, and try to avoid getting to the database as much as we can. But when we're there, we try to be very, very, very efficient. And when I look at the design patterns that come out of some of the object relational mapping systems, systems like, uh, like Django, which is great for lots of things, it tends to be really simple in the schema and really complex in the Python. And I think that sometimes that can be a big mistake, sometimes. So. Yeah, I'm really a fan of having other programmers write the complex code. I have to admit, I mean, if, especially if it's a library, let them deal with the complex stuff. Make it as easy as they possibly can for me, please. Let me do bracket, negative one bracket. So yeah, I agree. Uh, <clears throat> since everyone's going for seconds, uh, about the keeping the, the schema simple, uh, one thing, I, you guess you said leverage you know, external libraries as much as possible uh, was one of your comments. and. Trust that the other people are just smarter than you. Uh, I would say trust but verify because there's a lot of good Python, there's a lot of great Python, and there's an even more like there's a humongous amount of crap. And just I agree. be very careful about the internals. And it really, you need to have more than a passing interest in how it, how it actually works. If you look at like a lot of these, especially object relational mappers, that is like a big pet peeve of mine that they're all kind of crunky. Um, so just minimal levels of abstractions are usually a lot lot better. Um, Yes, actually, I, I, I do agree. Um, I'm pretty picky about which code I pull in. I just don't randomly start pulling in stuff. Um, in fact, some of my coworkers get mad at me because I have like certain feelings about who out there writing open source libraries like writes really good stuff and who writes stuff that sometimes you have to think about and look carefully. And so, yeah, like just because somebody else wrote it didn't doesn't mean it's better than yours. In fact, it's often not the case. It's when you can trust someone, I, I do. I mean, anytime you can find someone smarter than you and trust them and, and know it's good, that's great. Like, I trust Apache, I trust Guido, I trust Alex. Um, I don't so much trust a lot of other things. Um, so Dennis is going to kill me. Um, he, we have one more question. Do we want to let just it slide one, in? Just one more comment. Okay. But it's the same thing. Is just make sure someone consumes your code or uses it. That always helps. You know, that's... 
Hey, thanks. Thanks for your time.